Now, folks, it's time to stop that tanker with a nonviolent human circle. Why do we have to resort to nonviolence? Can't we just kick their asses? Now, little lady. What I'm going to do tonight is read an essay that was sent to me by email that is very much in keeping with these principles, with the dynamics of what creates order and what creates chaos and how critical it is for us to understand that, to know, intellectually know, not have a belief system about it, but to intellectually understand how these forces work, how our choices, whether they are in harmony with natural law principles, with moral law, higher moral law principles, how they create the reality that we must experience as a result of those choices. And until we understand that, no progress is going to be made. We're going to be wandering blind, completely blind, in a desert of useless ideologies that really cannot do us any true good. This essay was sent to me by a friend who was on the show previously, Daryl Rowland. Daryl Rollins, and he he sent me this by email, and this is a link from a internet forum. And the person posting calls themselves Aquinas. So I, I called this essay, it wasn't titled because it was just a forum response online, and I termed this essay Aquinas on Liberty. So I'll read it and then I will chime in and comment on some of the concepts contained in it and expand on them a little bit. Aquinas on Liberty. As long as we abide in partial darkness, we will continue to be conquered. If we looked very closely at the idea of liberty, we would discover that there is a radical distinction between true human liberty and liberty falsely so called. Indeed, liberty falsely so called is that same liberty which the New World Order qualifies as, quote, the bait of an idea to attract the masses of the people to one's party for the purpose of crushing another who is in authority, unquote, and as an idea of freedom which is really an infection and as a slackening of the reins of government. So what this person is saying in this first paragraph is there is true human freedom and then there is a notion or an idea of freedom that is put out by the establishment as controlled opposition, as basically baiting people into one's own movement for the purpose only of opposing another movement that currently happens to be in power at the time. This is how the two-party system constantly plays upon each other. They go back and forth, and it's controlled opposition. Never actually true freedom. Continuing with the essay. Where does the false idea of liberty come from? What is false liberty? What is true liberty? Knowledge of the correct answers to these questions is still lacking in the bulk of the patriot movement. And to the degree that it is lacking, so is integral unity and true power to overcome the menace. Until the patriot movement unifies itself under true philosophical principles, it will win only apparent victories while the satanic New World Order continues its long march to total global domination. True liberty 
is the highest of natural endowments. It is the portion only of intellectual or rational natures, and it confers on man this dignity, that he is in the hand of his counsel and has power over his actions. But the manner in which such dignity is exercised is of the greatest moment, inasmuch as on the use that is made of the liberty of liberty the highest good and greatest evil alike depend. Man indeed is free to obey his reason, to seek moral good, and to strive unswervingly after his last end. Yet he is free also to turn aside to all other things, and in pursuing the empty semblance of good, to disturb rightful order, and to fall headlong into the destruction which he has voluntarily chosen. Worse still are those who promote a false and absurd notion of liberty by perverting the idea of freedom or extending it to things in respect of which man cannot rightly be regarded as free. What he is saying here, he or she is saying here is, we are free to use our free will to come into harmony with natural law and thus create order, or we are also, and we are also free to use our free will to choose to ignore and or break natural law, attempt to break natural law principles, and therefore create a hell for ourselves if that is what we choose. And this is working, I will add that this is working, whether we are conscious of how that dynamic works or not. This works unconsciously. The, the goal is to understand how these principles work so that we can consciously come into harmony with them and therefore become conscious co-creators of our reality that we experience. Continuing with the essay, the Declaration of Independence states as follows, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Sad to say, this is a very ambiguous and therefore dangerous proposition, as it is subject to any number of conflicting interpretations. Indeed, the proof of its weakness is the young age of the total collapse of the American Republic. Obviously, that clause has not been interpreted properly. If it had been, we would not have devolved into barbarity in less than 250 years. It can be argued that the American Republic was built on Freemasonic sand, and thus, if we are going to rebuild it, we might want to recodify our foundational principles. In order for America to throw off its internationalist oppressors, a proper understanding of natural human liberty in the minds and hearts of the American people is indispensably necessary. For we the people have been brought low and have been rendered soft and vulnerable as the direct result of having imbibed and believed a false notion of liberty and the pursuit of happiness. As a natural endowment given to human nature by God, the omnipotent creator of the universe, liberty must exist for an end or ultimate purpose. And this end must be identical to the essential determination and composition of human nature, which is rational, i.e. intellectual and volitional. The end or object both of the rational will and of its liberty, is that good only which is in conformity with reason. 
So I'll chime in here and say, what he is saying is, when we use our free will, the only way that we can actually create liberty or freedom as an end is if what we choose with that free will is in harmony with natural law principles. One and the same with true reason. And that's what he is saying here. It must be done in a rational, intellectual, and volitional free will way. Continuing. Liberty belongs only to those who have the gift of reason or intelligence. Animals do not possess liberty. Considered as to its nature, it is the faculty of choosing means fitted for the end proposed. For he is master of his actions who can choose one thing out of many. Freedom of choice is, therefore, the essential property of the human will. But the will cannot proceed to act until it is enlightened by intellectual knowledge. For the proper object of the will is the good. The will cannot proceed to act until it is enlightened by the intellect. Nothing can be desired by the will unless it is judged by the intellect to be a good. Thus, in all voluntary acts, choice is subsequent to an intellectual judgment that something is good or desirable. The will is referred to as the appetitive power of the soul, or the rational appetite. Like the intellect, the will is a spiritual faculty. It is that power through which an individual seeks to execute an act or attain to an object proposed to it by the intellect. The object of the will is always the good, and even in the election of evil, it must be proposed to the will under the appearance of good. Anything chosen as a means is therefore viewed under some aspect of goodness. This is critical. I'm chiming in here now and saying that this is critical to understand. He is saying that the will, people's will, is driven by what they feel to be good, what they think of as good, what they believe to be good. And therefore, they can be fooled into choosing an action that is not in harmony with the natural law, that will create disorder, that will create chaos, that will create what we call evil, in their ignorance of natural law principles because something was proposed to them under the auspices of the good. Someone says, you do this, you take this action, and good will result from it. Not taking it may result in chaos, when in fact the exact opposite is true. That in most cases, taking actions that are not in harmony with natural law, that are based in control, and based in fear, and based in illusory power, will create nothing but chaos and disorder in the world. And until people understand, the ignorant people who are being fooled into doing these actions, by someone telling them that if they don't take such actions, the chaos will result, they are actually doing the work of evil, unknowingly. Unknowingly, not consciously, but unconsciously because they are not conscious. They do not have the developed intellect, the developed ability to recognize truth from falsehood. We're not talking about just left brain intellect here, as he's using the word. This is holistic intelligence, reason, the ability to be able to tell what is actually taking place, both within oneself and in the environment 
or the realm in which the self exists and operates. Or what I gave earlier in this podcast, in this radio program, as the definition for consciousness itself. Continuing with the essay. Therefore, because in all voluntary acts, choice is subsequent to a judgment upon the truth of the good presented, declaring to which good preference should be given, it is an immutably true principle that human liberty depends entirely on intellectual judgments that conform to reason and the natural law. If a judgment which does not conform to the natural law or to reason, and which is, therefore, objectively false and immoral, is acted upon by the will, then it is a source of grave disorder in society. Exponentially multiply the number of individual immoral acts, and you have a republic that collapses from moral decay in a short period of time. Absolutely amazing. This is one of the most profound understandings of how natural law works that I've ever read anywhere. And that's saying something. Because I've read voraciously since I was very young. And this person has a profound understanding of how natural law works in the world. I'm going to read that paragraph again and take it, analyze it a bit at a time. Because in all voluntary acts, choice is subsequent to a judgment upon the truth of the good presented, declaring to which good preference should be given. What he is saying here is when we choose something by our own free will, okay, we are acting upon what we believe to be true. And we are saying, we are declaring to which good preference should be given. We're saying out of all these possible options, I'm going to choose to do this because I think that is the way to go about things. I think that is the way to actually create good. But the problem with this is, if we are mistaken or misled in our judgment upon the truth of the good presented, what if we are deceived? What if we bought a lie? What if we do not have a true understanding of what that action will really bring about when we take it? I would suggest to the listening audience that this is where most of humanity is at in consciousness. We do not understand the repercussions, the true repercussions in natural law of our behaviors. And that's why we are continuing to get results in the world that we do not wish to experience. In the next part of that sentence he says, it is an immutably true principle. So immutably means unchanging. It always works this way. Immutable comes from the Latin verb muteo mutere, which means to change. Immutable means cannot be changed, impossible to change. It always works a certain way. That's how natural law works. An immutably true principle. Principle means first things. You know when we say first things first? Well, we're to referring to principles, that which we should put first and act in accord with first true principles. It is an immutably true principle that human liberty depends entirely, not in part, entirely, 100%, on intellectual judgments, and he means holistic intellectual judgments, not just left brain logical thought. Logic and analytical 
and linear thinking combined with intuitive and nurturing and non-linear thinking. Care, true care, wisdom. Okay, in, in occult traditions, this is talked about this the, this difference between pure intellect and wisdom is talked about in Kabbalistic teachings. The tree of life in Kabbalah, which we'll be talking a lot more about occult traditions in coming weeks. But the the tree of life is made from these spheres or emanations known as sephirot. There are ten of them on the tree of life. And the top one is unity, pure unity consciousness that even transcends thought. It is pure being, pure unity consciousness. This is known as Keter in Kabbalah. But below that, there are two spheres, Chokmah and Binah, wisdom and understanding. Chokmah is true wisdom. Binah is intellectual understanding, knowledge. But then uh, Chokmah is wisdom. It is what you do with what you know through holistic intelligence, through having developed true higher order reason faculties by having a balanced brain. And that is the sphere that is closest to the highest point on the tree of life known as Keter. We need to develop true wisdom, true higher level intellect, holistic intelligence in other words. That is what lets us understand which judgments we will make that will conform with the natural law. So once again, that sentence is critical. It is an immutably true principle that human liberty depends entirely on intellectual judgments that conform to reason and the natural law. If a judgment which does not conform to the natural law or reason, and which is therefore objectively false and immoral, think about that, what he's saying there. When when our judgment does not conform to natural law, By definition, it is objectively false and it is also immoral. That's absolutely true and that is absolute profound understanding of how natural law functions and how free will functions within the boundaries of natural law to create our reality. A brilliant, brilliant assessment in language of how this dynamic works. I I, I totally commend this person for having written this with such clarity. If judgment which does not conform to the natural law and which is therefore objectively false and immoral is acted upon by the will, then it becomes a grave, a source of grave disorder in society. And that's just what we've been saying here on this program. When we are not in harmony with natural law principles, we create chaos. And if we don't know how they work, not believe, understand, and really know how they work, our actions cannot come into alignment with true wisdom and therefore create order. They can only create chaos. When you exponentially multiply the number of individual moral acts, you have a republic that collapses from moral decay, moral decay decay in a short period of time. And that's where we're at, folks. That's where we're at. What led to people losing their freedom is the moral decay in America. Call it as self-righteous as you want. Say that I'm generalizing as much as you want. That is true. That is what is actually creating it. I am simply stating how a law functions. That's it. It is no more egoic or self-righteous than stating how the law of gravity functions. It's how it is. It is simply the case. Period. The end. Sorry if you don't like it stated that way, but I don't sugarcoat things here on this program or in life in general. So going back to the essay, I'll wrap up the last paragraph. Hedonism, i.e. the tyranny of the passions, has no place in the well-ordered man or in the well-ordered civilization. Unfortunately, 
Our elitist overlords have long been at dumbing us down to the level of beasts that cannot employ their natural rational endowments, but only their carnal lusts. We allowed this to happen to us because we mistakenly believed that the lie they told us, namely that true liberty is the right to do whatever we want, whenever we want, as long as it is not illegal or discoverable. True liberty is an essential property of objective truth and morality. Therefore, there can be no true liberty in a civilization that enshrines moral relativity. And that's the end of the essay. And I'd like to go back over that paragraph because of how profound it is as well. Hedonism, the tyranny of the passions, meaning the pleasure principle, living life purely for pleasure of oneself, one's own carnal pleasures, never taking an interest in wider global affairs, in whether human beings are living in harmony with natural law, are living in moral ways with each other. Just just saying, as long as I'm comfortable and as long as I have the things that make me comfortable and happy, I don't care about what happens to anyone else. That's the, the ideology, the way of being in the world called hedonism. The tyranny of the passions, this person refers to it as. He's, they say it has no place in the well-ordered man or in the well-ordered civilization. Here's the concept of order again. What creates order? I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with enjoy, that there's something wrong with enjoying life. I'm not saying there's you can never have any fun. That's not. Don't get it twisted and say that's what I'm saying because those words never came out of my mouth. What this person is saying and what I'm agreeing with is that hedonism. This is the pleasure principle gone awry to an extreme. In a world where immense suffering is taking place all around us, all we really care about is whether we're comfortable and happy in our own little pocket of the world. That's, that has no place in the well-ordered being or the well-ordered society. He says, Unfortunately, our elitist overlords have long been at dumbing us down to the level of beasts that cannot even employ their rational endowments but only their carnal lusts and take a look around folks take a look around that's exactly what has happened through mind control through the education system that we have set up in the western civilization and indeed around the world and through the prison of the left brain living only for the physical connected totally with the five sense illusion and with ego identification and attachment, the identification with the roles we play, as we're going to continue to talk about in the second hour tonight. All connected with barriers to self-realization, the actualization and realization of who we really are. Continuing to break down this last paragraph, we allowed this to happen to us because we mistakenly believe the lie, the big lie, that true liberty is the right to do whatever we want, whenever we want, as long as it, as it is not, quote, illegal. Not in accordance with natural law, but in accordance, or not in accordance with the law of man. We could do whatever we want. That's not what the true will means, capital W. It does not mean do whatever you want. When the occultist Aleister Crowley wrote the words, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Will and law means capital W will, and law means capital W L law. To do the true will one must be in harmony with higher level law, moral law, natural law. People never quote the second part of that phrase, which is love 
is the law. The force of love, the expansive force of consciousness is the law, the higher law, capital L, the law of creation, natural law. Another aspect of that quote is, do the will and no other shall say nay. You will not have suffering if you are in compliance with natural law principles. Love consciousness, non-dual consciousness. Continuing with the breakdown. True liberty is an essential property of objective truth and morality. What we've been talking about from the very beginning of this show. There is such a thing as objective truth and there is such a thing as objective morality. Our actions fall into two categories. That those which we do have the right to take and those which we do not have the right to take. And those which we do have the right to take are called rights. And those which we do not have the right to take are called wrongs. The refusal to accept this, that this is in place, that this is true and operating upon us, is what has worked us into the mess that we are worked into. And until people accept that, don't expect it to change, ladies and gentlemen. Do not expect it to change for an instant. Because it is not going to until those principles are accepted as truths and as laws that are in operation, that we are bound by at all times and all places as long as you are in this three-dimensional space-time universe. And again, I'm not worried about other universes. On this show, I talk about what goes on in this realm. That's why the show is called What on Earth is Happening. Not what's happening in some other dimension of space-time reality or time-space reality. I don't know about those realms. I, I am, do you ever hear the phrase, be here now? Be here now. There's no other moment except now. There's no other place except here. So be here now. Worry about other realms when you're operating within those other realms. If you have a way to get to other realms, wonderful. Do it, prove that you could do it, and then teach other people how to do it if you can get them out of this place, out of this hell, okay? But while we're here, if we're going to change the dynamic that we experience while we are here, then come to grips with being here and operating within the now. So... That is how moral law works. That liberty is a property of it. When we are in harmony with moral law, taking only the actions which we have the right to take, or being in harmony with the will, capital W, as we talked about previously on this show, then we will become free. If we ignore that, and we accept moral relativism, that there is no such thing as objective right or wrong, then we're going to go deeper, deeper, and deeper, and deeper, and deeper into a prison. And I, it's, it's fine, actually. It's fine. That's how it works. Moral law, higher level, natural law, is always working, it's always in effect, and it always works perfectly. So there's no reason to even get upset about that. What we should really be getting partially upset about, if anything, is the fact that so many people are ignorant of how moral law principles work and are, in their ignorance, choosing to basically break those laws or violate them. Let's not even use the word break because they really can't be broken. They are, in effect, we are bound by them and they operate, period. The final sentence of this essay is, there can be no true liberty in a civilization that enshrines moral relativity. 
and that this is exactly what I've been talking about for weeks on this show. As long as we accept the notion that there is no such thing as truth and no such thing as objective, objective, right or wrong, there can be no freedom. And the patriot movement and the freedom movement does not have a deep enough understanding of this. And I'll be the one to say that, since no one else is. Since some other people are, obviously. This, this person has a brilliant, deep understanding of it. And I would suggest he is an obviously an avid reader and constructs the language brilliantly. I would suggest that this understanding comes from studying occultism as well, which I'll bet if you spoke with that person, they would have a grasp of occult philosophies. So, the best assessment of natural law principles that I've heard in a long, long time. My hat's off to Aquinas, whoever you are. (laughs) 